And uh, Shane has uh, graciously uh, agreed to present about uh, this and uh, we'll uh, hopefully learn a bit here. I'm real interested in uh, seeing just exactly how I can use it and make it work uh, for stuff. Yeah. So uh, SPAC is a edge manager um, that's mostly built around uh, building stuff from source. Um, it's targeted at HPC primarily, which is uh, where our application of it is uh, greatest. We maintain a uh, not insignificant uh, list of packages that are built with SPAC that uh, we use for orchestrating rebuilds of that when we need to for whatever reason, like if I change the way OpenMPI does something in the cluster, or we, you know, want to update Python, or even in like an especially insane scenario where we were, uh, when if we were to decide to go to, you know, uh, ARM64 or something, um, SPAC would make it pretty easy to rebuild in that scenario. Um, this is the project page here. Uh, it's available at spec.io if you want to check it out yourself. Um, the project itself is on GitHub. There's a read the docs uh, for it that has a actually pretty helpful tutorial, but I'm just going to do a demo here in a bit where I'll start from uh, zero and show you how to do a somewhat simple package install or whatever. Um, but the about page has some good examples of how like the spec defines a package. Generally, you have what's called a spec, uh, which is a pretty uh, well featured uh, little domain specific language kind of for um, how to define like how a, what a package is and how it's built. Um, some examples on this page go on to like, you know, just installing a specific version of HDF5, installing a specific version of HDF5 with a particular compiler, installing a specific version of HDF5 with a, uh, a variant, installing it with specific C flags uh, and targeting a specific like backend or whatever. Um, and going into some of the other features that, you know, makes back nice, everything goes into its own uh, prefix. So you can have like multiple Python versions installed and everything's fine because it all goes to its own like installation uh, destination. Uh, got an example of what a package in spec might look like. There are a bunch of different build um, systems already defined in spec that take a lot of the common workflows with this specific packaging type, like something that uses auto tools, something that just uses a make file, something that uses uh, CMake. Uh, I think there's one for Bazel um, and probably a handful of other um, like uh, configure, build configuration systems. There's also ones for Python packages since those have you know their own uh, stuff, R packages, etc. Um, you know, so just to give you an idea of how we use it, get it out of my way, zoom toolbar. So we have our own SPAC fork, which is mostly just for contributing back to the project. Uh, we maintain our configuration. Um, this is on our EL9 branch. So this is currently what we're using for compiling software uh, on our cluster at Iowa State. Um, we're just using the built-in uh, RHEL 9 system compiler here, which is 1121 uh, for 9.0. I think it's 11.2.2 for 9.2 and I have a part 9.1 and I haven't looked at 9.2 yet. Um, all the config for SPAC is done with YAML files, uh, much to some people's chagrin uh, because uh, there's uh, 
scalability issues uh, with like going through and parsing all this YAML every time you do something. Um, so these are the basic config uh, files for spec. Uh, we saw the compiler one. There's concretizer here. The concretizer controls how like a spec uh, spec is actually like concretized, made like uh, representative. Uh, so broadly, packages have like uh, dependencies, like depends on Python, depends on whatever. The concretizer concretizer goes through and uh, looks at all those dependencies and actually makes them like okay, Python three ten ten, uh, GCC blah lib. Uh, PNG, whatever, like specific version variants, whatever. Um, all of that is controlled uh, by how you invoke like spec with the particular spec, but you can also uh, apply broad defaults in the uh, packages.yaml file. Um, a lot of this is boilerplate that's taken from the uh, uh, default config, but what we've defined here is that everything's going to be compiled with GCC 11.2.1, um, unless it can be for whatever reason. Um, sometimes some things uh, use Clang, but uh, this will force GCC 11.2.1 as hard as it can. It's targeting x86.64 v3 because that's a broadly generic uh, virtual microarchitecture that reflects uh, what's available in the cluster. And then a lot of these are virtual packages. Um, so awk, for example, awk has a number of uh, implementations. Uh, the one that we uh, use is gawk. Uh, Blas, your uh, linear algebra library, has a number of packages that implement it. We select either open or and deep list for the one package that needs that. Uh, generally, we prefer open Blas. and so on, so on, so on here. Uh, CUDA, we're restricting to either versions 11.8.0 or 11.6. Um, you'll notice some redundancy here. Version is a kind suggestion for the concretizer. Uh, it's like, okay, please use 11.8.0 uh, or 11.6. Requires is I wasn't asking. Uh, sometimes you have to be um, a little bit more firm with it. Uh, some packages are weird. Um, the specific version we want to build with OpenBlast without the ILP64, that 64-bit uh, indices, because it breaks certain APIs in this thing. Wasn't expecting them. Um, Python, we're locking to 310 with uh, the variance TK inter and optimization. Variants are kind of like how use flags works uh, in Gen 2, if you're familiar with that, basically just allows you to, you know, build a slightly different version of the package. Um, R, we're requiring certain variants. And further on down, we have uh, external libraries defined. Spec has the capability of like reusing system libraries if you want it to. By default, it basically bootstraps everything it can other than uh, the compiler, although you can also have it build a compiler and then build everything else with that compiler too, if you really want to. Um, we're logging to a specific version of hrelock, flip event, uh, bunge, MATLAB, Mathematica, PMIX, and slurm. Those PMIX, slurm, and uh, a hardware lock or and lib event are important for open MPI shenanigans. Um, this is the uh, package list that we have um, on the cluster right now, and this is not everything. This is everything that we install explicitly, which then have a bunch of dependencies that are just pulled in. Um, so the actual package list is greater than 380, whatever, when it uh, insta installs. Um, most of them are straight defaults. Some of them have, you know, uh, Variants to find like FFmpeg, we want X support, we want BZ lib, we want draw text, we want GPL, lib AOM, lib MP3 lane, lib JPEG, lib opus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you've ever, you know, gone to compile FFmpeg for, you know, like reasons and, you know, wanted everything under the sun, you 
might have found that was actually kind of difficult to do. If, uh, spec makes it a little bit more tenable. Um, a lot of stuff. And uh, this list is uh, legacy stuff that we've, hopefully this is halfway readable for you people. I don't know, my text is kind of tiny. You know, if I need to make it bigger. Um, it would be helpful if you could uh, uh, up it just a couple notches. Uh, I, I know I went to the eye doctor here uh, start of the year, but uh, that was pushing it just a bit. Yeah. Thank uh, you. That, that, that's what Zoom is for, Andrew. <laughs> um, a lot of this is just legacy. Our original usage of spec grew very organically, where we were just adding stuff to it over time. And when we made the transition from RHEL 7 on the cluster to RHEL 9, uh, had to rebuild everything. So I just kind of changed the way that we did things a bit. Uh, so a lot of these package lists in here are stuff that was asked for by someone at some point in the past. Uh, no real. We do actually log usage data through other means, but I don't know how much of this offhand is actually actively used. Um, and then when we're building stuff, um, I've got the whole like build environment here. Like this is a bash script that uses builda to uh, build the container uh, that functions as the build environment for the entire uh, stack. It pulls from uh, UBI 9 uh, over lease installs some additional packages uh, here and uh, also some RPMs, mostly the Slurm stuff uh, so that it's in there because Slurm includes its own version of PMIX. And if we want the open MPI integrations to work very nicely with Slurm, we have to do it that way. And then that uh, is invoked with this script here that just uh, is a wrapper for a podman run invocation that passes through a bunch of uh, stuff for the artifacts to go and uh, for the spec like source itself. And then cleanly removes the container when it's done. Um, got a whole write up about build assumptions here and how everything works. And then uh, this just ultimately uh, loops through that package list that we saw earlier, and then uh, runs spec install um, on every element in there until the uh, install is done, which at the current uh, size of the environment takes about 18 hours on a machine that is 10 years old. Um, so it'd be faster if I had a uh, different box to use for building software. Uh, uh, Disk is a, you know, obviously a major bottleneck when you're doing a lot of uh, this, like just compiling software stuff. Uh, so uh, Flash is nice to have, which this particular machine does have, but uh, it's also, you know, CPU does make a difference. The more cores you got, uh, depending on how parallelized uh, a particular piece of software is, uh, could pretty significantly speed things up. Um, so this is software that I actually submitted a pull request to get a recipe added into spec not too long ago. Um, this one is weird. You know, a lot of software at least tries to be halfway helpful for you. Uh, includes like, you know, if it's auto tools based to configure script, which then generate a make file and, you know, install or compile and install with make, or we'll just have a static make file, what have you. Uh, these people, uh, one, don't believe in versioning their software, and two, just distribute everything as a single source file. So it's easy enough to invoke uh, GCC with it. They do a lot of floating point in it, and the fact that they recommend using this argument scares me. Um, but here we go. You should never use FastMap for that. No. <laughs> it's right. Oh, uh, Brendan and David Golet um, figured out all the packages that were pulling that flag and screwing up everybody's flow settings. Mm -hmm. 
anyway, sorry to derail you here. That's fine. Um, so this is what that looks like translated into a SPAC recipe. And SPAC does a lot of this boilerplate for you. Um, you just do like SPAC create and then give it to li the link to like these archive that you want to make a package out of. And it'll, it'll fetch that for you. It'll check summit for you. It'll extract it for you. It'll look at it and be like, is this an auto tools package? I, I'll make it an auto tools package. This is a make file package, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This one being just a single uh, source distribution uh, does not inherit from a particular package type. It's just a package. Um, Packages have home pages. They have URLs for to fetch the thing. Um, packages in spec have versions, typically referred to by whatever like version number the release was made. Since this one doesn't actually use any versioning scheme, I'm just using the date uh, from the paper that it's in that was published from. Uh, everything is checked. Some shop two fifty six is the default these days. I can't recall offhand what checksums are supported, but I believe it's easy enough to extend them that if they need to, it's not even a problem. The default used to be MD five. Um, yeah, and even back then it was usually shop two fifty six. And then here's how you define like a variant for a package. Technically, best practices for spec for like C flags and stuff, you just that's just an argument that you can pass at install time. So you would just specify C flags uh, FS map. But because the authors for that specifically, uh, you know, said to use that, I decided to make it a little bit more obvious for people that are consuming the package down the line that, hey, you know, maybe here's a thing you can do it. Um, the phases or Packages in spec have phases. Um, by default, the package uh, type only has install. Um, other versions have, or other build systems have different phases. I just gave this one some, a build phase, which just um, gets the uh, C++ uh, compiler from the spec when this is actually you know code in <clears throat> spec is all python or primarily python uh the spec like recipe uh is like a uh, dsl extension onto python this is all eventually like interpreted by python when it becomes in that the self.compiler uh, cxx is the compiler as specified in the whole spec and I can show you what like a uh, concretized spec looks like here in a bit when we get to the demo. Um, so that'll get the C++ compiler that's either been requested by the user or was selected by the uh, concretizer. Pass 03, if for whatever reason, somebody has decided that they actually want uh, fast math with the fast math variant, we uh, go ahead and append that to the args list if it's part of the spec. Uh, spec satisfies. you can put basically anything in the like spec or the spec language here and if the uh package when it's concretized meets those specifications that uh conditional is true and then we just uh invoke cxx uh with the uh specified arguments which will be gcc in those cases here and then we make a directory and install that to it very exciting so transition to the, this one is probably the right one. Well, that's going down. Uh, there was a question in the chat whether or not you can uh, uh, build packages that are uh, just static binaries for uh, use. You can, but usually that requires an additional like variant 
uh, for the package. That's usually how it's implemented in packages. Not every package that exists is going to be able to or have a static variant. Uh, some do. I ran into one that I was confident with. Micro Mamba, if you're familiar with uh, that, it's like a C rewrite of uh, uh, Anaconda. Uh, and that has a static build option. Um, but usually, usually there's so much additional glue that's necessary for like a uh, static build to go. You can't just like do it unless somebody's written the package to actually support it. Anyway. Let's go ahead and activate the shell integrations because I'm lazy. Did you actually find that, or do I have some like latent config somewhere? Uh huh. There's nice integrations anymore uh, with SPAC where it can go through and helpfully, hopefully, uh, detect uh, the environment that it's running in and go ahead and like, grab compilers. You see it's uh, found 13.1.1 uh, and 16.0.3 for Clang there. Probably thrown in the same config file. Yep. Uh, again, everything's YAML. So, Let's look at what we can do here. There are a bunch of packages available in SPAC. Just thinking out loud. This is just going to list them all eventually, perhaps. This is highlighting some of the issue of everything being a YAML file. Yeah, it takes a lot to parse. 7,185 packages. Let's look at what we would need to do to install Python. So uh, spec spec, this is not a step that you actually need to take. This is just me demonstrating uh, what uh, you know the dependency tree of the concretized spec looks like. Uh, this is what it looks like for Python. Um, so you can see a lot of default inferred variants here for Python, BZ2, Crypt, C types, DBM, uh, LibXML2, LZMA, PIC, PyXPad, Python CMD, Refine, Share, SQLite 3, SSL, UUID, and ZLib are all enabled by default. There are a handful of packages pulled in, and we are targeting uh, Fedora 39 and Zen 2. Python has a bunch of dependencies as a result of a number of those variants. Bzip2, which itself depends on diffutils, xpad, which depends on the BSD and the MD, GBM, getx, libicon v, libxml2, tar, et cetera, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. All very exciting. Um, let's go ahead and install it. We'll just do this. Python itself doesn't take too terribly long. Uh, by default, SPAC runs with, I think it detects the number of CPUs available on your system and uh, will make those available for everything to use. Um, there are a number of different ways to do like distributed builds if you really want to. You can actually in invoke it with MPI run um, on Slurm and it'll just dis it'll distribute the installation text to a bunch of different nodes in your cluster if you want to i don't use that um you can have it uh you can create what's called an environment um, and i can go through and look at some of the older attempts i had at doing where uh whole 
uh, collection of packages install thing. But you can define an environment, uh, which is basically just like a list of specs that need to be installed and um, definitions for how they should be compiled. But you combine all those YAML configuration files that we saw earlier into like one environment file, define the specs that need to be installed, create an environment from that environment file, concretize that entire environment, which depending on how you've set up the um, uh, concretizer uh, will go through and like make it so that there is only one version of Python that everything uses. With our environment, that's not, or, you know, one version of libpng or one version of uh, SSL libs or what have you, open SSL that everything uses. Our package environment is so weird and filled with some old stuff that isn't necessarily like maintained anymore that that wasn't tenable for us. Um, but like, say you wanted to define an environment that was a specific version of WORF or whatever, which is like a meteorology uh, simulation package, uh, you could do that and you could distribute uh, that environment such that anybody could be instantiated on any other cluster or anywhere else, and it will be built the exact same way, assuming you don't know, all the same compilers and everything are built are available. That's one of SPAC's like project goals is reproducibility. Like uh, you should be able to regenerate uh, like the same version of SPAC or a same version of a package elsewhere using SPAC, so long as like the spec is exactly the same, you know, the same compiler and all of that. Uh, it actually, one of the things that I have to go through every time we end up rebuilding the entire stack, like we think the a GCC version or something, uh, is go through and resolve a bunch of build errors that crop up uh, just because, you know, stuff changes. Uh, libc moves forward, something can't, uh, I had a whole bunch of pull requests against spec, like middle of last year into this year uh, that were me just re uh, resolving uh, compilation issues with GCC 10 and above because GCC 10 changed the way uh, that it behaves with um, uh, variable reuse. So you know how if you're like, um, you define a routine or whatever in a header and you want it to be able to be used in different parts of your code, if you define any variables in that header, they need to be declared extern. Uh, before GCC 10, it was fine if you didn't do that. It just lumped them all into a common area and called them good. Um, after GCC 10, they're like, that's not good anymore. You want the old behavior, you have to pass this flag or you need to fix it so that extern stuff is properly declared. And that broke so many things that have not been updated in 10 years. Um, this is all going, you can see the individual like steps that are called for each package. Uh, XPAT, clearly an auto tools package, calls auto recon, calls configure, calls build, calls install. Um, a lot of things are auto tools or a lot of uh, like basic utilities are just you know, getting near the end here. Does anybody, does anybody have any questions while this uh, continues to chug along in the background? I guess I was a little surprised. So, so I, how much SIG is it supporting yet? How much what? The SIG. It's like a C replacement. Oh, I have no idea. Um, somewhat tangential, but the. Uh, the GitHub UI you had, I did not recognize. You had like a tree view on the left while you were showing us some of the code. How do you get that? I think this is just new. <laughs> oh, um, okay. I, like, I don't know. Maybe it's some AB thing that I'm being tested for. Gotcha. Well, I like it. I want to be in that group. <laughs> 
I guess I was just a little surprised that it wasn't uh, just be subbing the uh, compiled jobs into your cluster uh, directly. Uh, it can do that, but um, with the way that we have things uh, set up, it would be really difficult to do it properly. Um, we spec. One of the things that's really nice about spec with like traditionally uh, dynamically linked code is that it uses R paths instead of just you know like trusting that everything's set up fine in the linker. Um, so each like library and binary that's spat out by this uh, has the location of its uh, dependent you know like libraries actually written to it um, using R paths. So for like the SQLite that's installed here. And while that's going, maybe I'm just gonna pull up another one here and show you that. That's how Tar will do it probably to find out. So uh, you can see the uh, libraries that tar uh, links to at runtime here, uh, lib icon v, one of them, and uh, it's set with the R path in there uh, to the lib icon v that it was actually compiled against in spag. So the uh, 1.17, the bit after the version here is the like hash of the spec. So a lib icon v that is identical uh, spec wise to this lib icon B should end up with the same hash. That's not always the case, uh, but if it does, then it'll just reuse that library and not install another one. But if you install lib icon B that's, you know, got a different variant or whatever, or some different C flags associated with it, it'll have a different hash. That'll be a different path and it'll be selected separately. Um, Dump symbols. Let's see if I find so we'll just look at everything. <coughs> so here uh, you can see it's written to like the elf header for the tar uh, executable that these are the R paths that it should uh, search for the libraries that it needs at uh, link time, including the uh, GCC uh, lib icon V path and tar itself, and then uh, tar itself lib 64. That's uh, written as part of the executable. Um, and it should search those first, regardless of what LD path or LD uh, library path is set to. Um, this this was just found to be more um, safe. stable, safe. Yeah, probably a better way to put it uh, than relying on like uh, LD library path. And then also, if you get we with our R package, when you load that, uh, spec has a number of ways that it can do things for like, you know, setting up an environment. There's a spec load command. If you're like running on the machine that has spec that can, you know, set up the environment uh, for the package that you've installed and all of its dependencies to set runtime stuff too, because certain things still do need uh, LD library path, like a lot of Python stuff does uh, for external uh, dependencies and then you know set up path and all that so you can just type it instead of invoking it directly um but uh we have it generate module files for use in the cluster um and uh it'll set up all that stuff there too for like dependencies that actually need ld library path but when you load r for example with that it loads 50 some other packages and your ld library path at the end of that ends up looking like pretty obscene. 
And there's overhead for parsing that with the linker. You know, if there are main collisions, it could cause a problem. The R path just solves that. We're installing open SSL. Fascinating. Oh, now we're on to Python. Well, of course, R is known for its high performance uh, to start with. Uh -huh. the, if it's one thing that makes me grit my teeth, it's uh, the words production R. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we don't have, we, my group, don't have any of that, but we certainly do host a lot of production R for uh, groups. My my manager is a uh, self admitted uh, R programmer, and <laughs> it's right. an ongoing battle of no, you shouldn't put this in production. Regrettably, there's still so much of it. Is there C back into R? You can write packages uh, with the C ABI, but no, I mean, can you compile R to C? Or, I mean, is R interpreted or is it? It's R is interpreted, yeah. Okay. There's some stuff I think that actually, you know, kind of like how Cython works. I think there's like an R version of that too. And, yeah. There's our CPP if you want to use our libs and some CPP stuff, which you can. Uh, so Python's installed. That's exciting. The whole thing took what? Python itself took one minute, eight seconds. Exciting. Incredible. Uh, let's use it, I guess. Uh, we'll just use Spaglet. That's not the right Python. <laughs> Um, so for NBI jobs, a lot of people just zip file all their binaries. Say that again. So for NPI jobs, do a lot of users just zip file all their binaries? Uh I mean. In our environment, there are precious few people that are actually developing their own uh, code that uses MPI. A lot of them are using stuff that already exists, um, which they're just grabbing from GitHub and installing with like uh, MPI CC or what have you. Um, I think for people that do a lot of uh, HPC computation, they're going to be distributing the source and then recompiling because. Um, there's eccentricities with MPI between uh, sites or whatever. And a lot of times, just the safest thing to do is recompile it anyway. And that's before even getting into, you know, additional uh, performance benefits that you might see if you're specifically targeting the architecture that you're running on. Uh, so here's the Python we just built. You can see that it was built on May 17th, 2023 at 2012.09, which is about two minutes ago. I assume most of your stuff for this, you, you'll build uh, and essentially install your packages onto a shared uh, uh, network drive. Yeah, uh, so the entire it, HPC. in the cluster, uh, it's, it's sitting off of a uh, machine that provides the home storage uh, for our cluster. It makes the uh, software distribution actually available to anyone on campus, read only. Um, and all of our nodes mounted, uh, then uh, all the nodes have, we use LMOD, which is like a Lua rewrite of uh, environment modules. That's what the original package or the original project is called. Uh, it's certain, it looks in that mount point for where all the module files are. And then people just use like module load Python or whatever to load Python and then it just, reads it from that share and loads it into, you know, memory on the uh, cluster node and they're good to go. What network file system are you guys using? For the software distribution, it's just NFS specifically with the NFS4 protocol. I'm using the 
KNFSD. I've looked at using Ganesha because sometimes the KNFSD gets in the way. It sucks. Uh, and then for like actual file storage, uh, we use Luster. Okay. Um, oops. Uh, As opposed to if you were in a pure IBM like world, you'd probably be looking at, at GPFS or something like that. Probably, but man, even they are starting to push uh, Ceph mostly because of their acquisition of Red Hat Ceph. But uh, than that anymore. Uh, we like Luster because it's open source and it performs reasonably well most of the time. Isn't Luster like have a reputation for being tremendously faster than GPFS as well? Uh, yeah. Uh, Luster's entire thing is being fast. And for the most part, it is. Uh, I can saturate 100 gigabit per second link uh, with Luster with using spinning disks. Incredible. That is incredible. That's amazing. I've been, I did just FYI, Andy. I've been begging the uh, <clears throat> Kubernetes team to offer Luster support because it, it it apparently is available um, for about two years now um, and uh, have gotten limited headway. Good luck with that. Yeah, we 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 can sidebar this uh, after the recording's turned off, but yeah, good luck. Fundamentally, I mean, it's it's POSIX compliant, so I don't know what all the work or work would actually need to be done to do it. Um, there are you know, some luster specific shenanigans, but that's more for management the actual consumption of the file system. So I wouldn't think it'd be that hard. How, how efficient is it on disk space, by the way? Just just out of curiosity, like, like, like I assume the expensive part is you have to set up, you know, enough nodes and CPU and, and disks uh, and like, you know, either buying or renting that hardware would be expensive is what I would assume the cost is. Is, is that what you... The basic configuration for Luster uh, fundamentally like is a gigantic RAID zero across however many numbers of OSTs that you set up. And that's not quite accurate because the default behavior is to just round robin between your OSTs. But if you lose an OST by default, you lose everything that's on it, uh, which depending on how your file striping is set up in the file system could be literally everything or just a handful of files. Um, and then as far as like efficiency goes, that's kind of up to you on what you use for the OSTs themselves. Um, we have three uh, object storage servers for Luster right now. And then the uh, targets are uh, all ZFS pools uh, that are currently configured as either standalone RAID Z2 VDEVs or spans of RAID Z2. I'm trying to downsize the number of OSTs we have because we have too many and the overhead is an issue for the small number of OSSs that we have. Um, but, you know, uh, the backends can be either ZFS or LDISCFS, which is an EXT4 that's patched for Luster specific use. We like ZFS because it gives us the benefits of transparent compression uh, on the OSTs themselves. So we have uh, some OSTs that are logically storing, you know, like. 20 terabytes inside of 10 terabytes of actual usage. So the gains from there can be very real, but it also makes backing them up if you want to very easy. And then if you get into more advanced uh, setups with Luster, you can configure mirroring, and then you can configure failover between OSTs and OSSs. So if you lose an OSS, you don't necessarily lose the OSTs that are connected to it. And if you lose an OST, you've got you know, the data mirrored to another OST right now. They're working on some form of erasure coding, I think, um, to you know, give it a little bit more modern uh, redundancy, you know, options, but uh, not finished yet. New question on that: What is an OST? Object storage target. Uh, yeah, just at least the things with, are. Yeah, L Luster. The components are an MGS, which is a management server, an MDS, which is your uh, metadata server, 
And then there are metadata targets on metadata servers and uh, object storage servers, which have object storage targets. The uh, MDT translates, you know, like a POSIX file name into like the actual object ID, which is then fetched from the OSTs. Yeah, uh, gotcha. So, so what's the highest cluster load these days? It used to be computational chemistry. Uh, load? Like oh, on the no, loads? Executed code. I have no idea. Like we measure just based off of job throughput, uh, which varies based off of you know how many people are running things. We're not um, this cl the cluster that I run and maintain is not you know trying to hit uh, the top five hundred systems list or whatever. <laughs> it's relatively small. We only have like. Sixty nodes, seventy nodes, some seventy nodes in this thing, but they're really big nodes. Some of them have like you know four terabytes of RAM and like a hundred and eighty CPUs. But yeah, that's primarily what we use Stack for is just generating the software for that. And sometimes I use it for when I need to quickly compile something because it it is very nice to have something that'll take care of all the dependencies and everything for you for when you, you know, want to or need to compile something from source. That said, uh, the SPAC project does also what they've started doing over the past couple of years with uh, partnership with Amazon uh, is what they're calling build caches, which actually go through and uh, every time a PR is made, uh, it goes through the CI pipeline, which uh, goes through and builds a number of uh, environments um, just to test that those environments aren't broken by your changes and a bunch of other things. Um, and the build artifacts from that go into uh, build caches. And if your spec is configured, it can go through and actually pull down those binary artifacts. And, you know, that might sound kind of antithetical to uh, spec. Uh, being like source based and targeting specific hardware, but those build artifacts represent like that binary being built on a bunch of different uh, uh, targets and with different like C flags and all that other stuff. They only build like common uh, uh, permutations. But if you're building for like ARCH64, there's a build cache that's got like libraries and stuff. Uh, and binaries for certain things already available so that you don't have to waste time compiling them and you'll get a result that should basically be the same as if you had compiled it anyway. So it's sort of like uh, coming into uh, pre-compiling stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Because pretty much everyone's realized that it just takes forever if you want to build something truly from scratch. Yep. What else should we inspire or install that we can take like two days? GCC takes a long time. LLVM takes a long time. Kernel 2.4. Does FFM peg without every single variant under the sun take? Oh, I guess we can look at that. So if you do a SPAC info uh, package name, you can uh, see all of the options available for it. Here's FFM peg. There are a handful of versions uh, available. And every version, everything that's listed as safe version means that it's in the recipe. It has a checksum. So, you know, you know that you're getting the same thing, hopefully, that uh, the person who made the recipe did. Here's all the variants for it. Um, your basic variant is just a binary yes, no. Um, some can take multiple arguments, uh, like build systems, which isn't actually a part of the recipe itself. It's all, it's all packages have a build system, which is usually the one that it is. Uh, configured with, but sometimes projects change build systems uh, midway through their life cycle, like a uh, number of them change from like auto tools to CMake or Bazel. But 
but then it's also got the uh, build dependencies, which is everything that it actually needs to compile, the link dependencies, everything that it needs to link against at runtime. Uh, and then any run dependencies, if uh, applicable. Um, So do you see much FN tech use on your cluster? I mean, I can see for like uh, vision uh, image processing sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, some people's code will consume it and, you know, they just need it for something simple as, you know, translating a JPEG to a PNG or like an MPEG to, to whatever, X264 encoded MP4, um, that kind of stuff. Or some punks deciding to uh, transcode their DVD collection. You know, we don't get as many shenanigans as you would think. And partially that's because we've got it fairly locked down. Um, I, like, I'm constantly on the lookout for some smart ass trying to find Ethereum or whatever, but it doesn't, doesn't happen nearly as much as you would think. I'm kicking myself for not doing that in 2009. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's the R GDAL package. Um, there are some eccentricities about the way that packages are named in uh, SPAC. Anything that's an R package is usually, usually prefixed with R dash, Python, Pi dash, et cetera. Um, and that's just because you can have like space collisions otherwise. Um, you can see it has run dependencies of R and RSP. And then what I find useful, especially when I'm adding something to like our massive uh, dependency tree is to, you know, do the, the spec step just so that you can see what's all going to be uh, pulled in. I like to reuse packages that are already installed uh, when available, because adding another like Python to the list of Pythons that are available in a collection just ends up ultimately confusing people. Uh, just which Python do I load? Well, pick one, it really doesn't matter. But you know, the fewer that you have, the easier it is for people to understand. So here's the spec of R. Uh, and as you can see, just from installing Python earlier, we actually have a lot of the dependencies that R would use uh, already pulled in. Just a lot of basic uh, utilities and also Python itself um, is a dependency. Is Zen so, 2, is that your processor architecture? Yes. So you're compiling specifically for the processor architecture of your of your nodes? The default uh, per spec is to target the like machine that it's running on. With okay. the uh, package list that I showed earlier, uh, I specify the uh, x86-64 v3 microarchitecture instead. Uh, which is a little bit more broad. Um, it's actually, it would be completely compatible with Zen 2. But yeah, it's for stuff that's going to run on multiple machines, I like to be more broad with the architectures. And for most things, honestly, the CPU level optimizations, you're, you're going to be chasing. Uh, diminishing returns an awful lot. Yeah. Unless you're really, really, really special. Well, I mean, like, there's things like AVX 512, which can make a pretty big difference depending on your use case. Like, there are some use cases it makes no difference, but there are some that it makes more. And, you know, yes. enabling the right things can can help with a few different kind of instruction set things for sure, I think. I don't One know, of the I things don't feel that much with uh, you know instruction set specific things personally, but one of the things that a lot of people, especially cluster operators, found with the AVX five twelve uh, release is that some stuff is actually slower with AVX five twelve because uh, at least you know on the Intel uh, part, it's AMD. I think the most recent ones actually have a VX five twelve implementations, but with the Intel ones, um, they downclock. Uh, all the cores the moment like you kick it into AVX 512 mode and uh, like the AVX2 version of a binary might actually be faster than the AVX 512 one. 
Yeah, and that's why I think it's like very implementation specific. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we're very workload specific, I guess. For sure. I'm trying to remember how to tell this thing to spit out the targets that I know about. But then again, you can chase compiler flags for days. There we go. So these are all the targets that SPAC itself knows about and is configured for. Uh, we've got AH64, MV8, 1A, 3A, 5A, 2A, 4A, Power PC, Power PC 64, Power PC 64, Little Indian, Power uh, PC, Little Indian, Risk V, Risk 5, 64, Spark, Spark 64, X86, X86, 64, X86, 64, B2, B3, and B4. And, and then my specific uh, versions like for the x86 ones, they've got some of the P4 stuff. They've got the newer uh, core-based names here. Uh, can't even remember what the most recent one is in here, but it doesn't look like it's in here yet. Zen 4, all the other Zen crap back to KTAM. Um, some power PC stuff, 7, 8, 9, mobile Indian ones, uh, Caviums Thunder. Uh, Fujitsu's uh, Arch64 implementation, uh, some other ARM implementations, and then M1, M2 for Apple, and then a specific Sci5 implementation, I guess. Uh, not everything, not every package in SPAC is guaranteed to build on every uh, architecture that's in here necessarily. Uh, you do see time to time people spending pull requests for something that was only ever tested on x86-64 for, you know, ARH-64. Uh, similarly, the uh, um, support for Mac OS as a target is relatively new, and so is Windows. Um, there aren't that many recipes that are given to you to work necessarily on either, but I think the big ones work on either Linux or Mac generally out of the box. Not necessarily so the guaranteed. Latest, yeah. Yeah, the latest uh, Intel core is uh, Raptor Lake, but that, that's a desktop. Mm -hmm. I think Ice Lake is the latest server chip, isn't it? That seems right. So we've got quite the stretch if it goes all the way back to i686 and Pentium 2 and as new as both of Apple's. Mm -hmm. I would be honestly surprised if anyone is using uh, this at all. Um, and I would be really surprised if anybody is using uh, these two or even file driver. Zen is probably what most people are running it in DUIs these days at the very least. And I wish I could have forced some power nine hardware, not made of money. But yeah, uh, does anybody have any other questions? Anything they'd like me to show? Um, that spec is very powerful, and if you're if you have a package that you don't see in there that you would like to add, it is generally pretty easy to add um like it does a lot of the uh boilerplate for you and if the installation process is usually something like run configure make make install run c make make install uh, it's going to be pretty painless to add into spec and might even just work with just the boilerplate um, And then you get, you know, the more advanced things, which have a lot more going on with them, like WORF. WORF is a lot of work. Someone put in a lot of work to make WORF work in spec. It's very nice that they did that. Um, number of helper functions to find. Uh, mm -hmm number of versions, um, number of variants, compile type, 
of, for example, having multiple possible values, uh, a number of patches that are uh, applied to the source when certain conditions are met, the when decorator here. I guess, yeah, I could go into these a bit. That's helpful. Um, when WORF 3.9.1 uh, is being installed with the AOCC compiler at a version uh, no greater than 2.4.0, apply this patch. Uh, apply this patch when you're compiling with a Fujitsu compiler. Um, the uh, version ranges in WEN are inclusive. Uh, and they're pretty easy to decode. This says 4.2 and above. This one says 4.2 to version 4.2.0 inclusive. Uh, that is kind of uh, a kludgy way, but what that says is uh, uh, 4.2, uh, like all versions, inclusive to 4.2, I believe. Yeah, WERF is a, a big one. This is what all like the weather forecasting models are. This is one of the big uh, uh, versions of those. Um, so, you know, people running it on Fujitsu hardware, not surprising. And it's also uh, a special uh, thing. So there's there's a lot of love here to make it work. Yeah, and that's why it's caring about net CDF. Uh... Yeah, CDF5 and all those things. So with most package managers I've played with, like the pain points tend to be in like dependency management and like uh, dealing with like different dependency versions and conflicts and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> maybe like what what's the biggest pain point with using this that you've run into? Like is it is it that or is there is there a different thing like what's wh where do you like you know have the most heartburn with this most modern stuff really does just work uh, when you're adding a package and it has a ton of dependencies that aren't already in spec it's a lot of work because you have to add all those you know dependencies or whatever uh but once they're in there they're in there and they should generally work and you know until they break um i'm trying to find something that i've touched here that that would be like a good example of. And then it, I, I I mean I assume and maybe you showed this already, it just downloads the uh the source for the packages that you need, right? The dependencies it just it yep. downloads and compiles them automatically if if it's not already there's not already yep. a version with your with your uh settings. Yeah if you don't already have a version installed it generally defaults to the newest one. You can select that that like your install indication time or you can set up other rules that you know limit it to a specific version specific is there is range. there like compatibility issues like well i guess you like you you guess you specify you had all those your ats you know this version greater than that version or whatever you you constrain all that i guess yep this one isn't that weird I assume that could take a long time if you have to compile a whole bunch of dependencies though. Uh, well, like I said, the uh, stack that I'm installing right now, which is you know, 300 some packages plus dependencies takes about 18 hours. Yeah, that, that, I think that qualifies as a long time. Yeah. But that's kind of cool to kick off, though. You kick it off, and you're like, <laughs> "Watch it, watch it sing," you know. Well, let, yep. let's look at it go. It's so I we're in the middle of maintenance for the cluster right now, actually. And as part of that, I did a rebuild of the entire software stack because we were making some changes to the back end uh, networking. We're in the middle of transitioning from MePath to uh, HDR and Finiband. Um. And that's necessitated some changes to the open MPI config uh, and other stuff like MPish, other MPI implementations. Um, and I had that all ready to go. And then I realized that, oops, I forgot to actually include the updated uh, Slurm uh, RPMs in the build container, which uh, 
means the PMIX that it was built against is actually the PMIX that's running the cluster. So I uninstalled all the packages that depended on PMIX, which is really easy to do in spec. It's just that um, install and then uh, the hyphen basically, or the caret says uh, anything that's built with PMIX in this case. It could also be, you know, anything that depends on. Uh, but then case. how do you know how to install what you installed to you can install it back again? Uh, I just have that authoritative list. Okay. So like uh, I uninstalled everything that depended on PMIX in this case, and then made those changes so that when it installs again, it'll pull in uh, and rebuild like open MPI and build it against the updated version of PMIX that's in the container. Is, is there a command where you can use your like hat PMX or hat tar command to just see all the different things? Like, is there like a dry run maybe? Yeah, you could do a spec uh, find and LV is probably good there. And then we'll do tar again here. So we can see that uh, get text and Python both uh, were built against tar. So you could maybe do your find first to see, mm -hmm. hey, my authoritative list of everything I'm going to install. Save yep. that, right? So yep. you can install everything back again, uninstall it, and then you could install everything from your list that you piped out. You can also cool. uh, do explicit. So that'll return every package that was explicitly installed, not like a pulled in as a dependency or whatever. Uh, and in this one, we've only installed uh, Python 3.10.10. So that's the only one that's returned there. And, and then, then you, you can, can explicit is probably what you'd want to use for your, your reinstall then, right? Because then yep. all the so inputs could. ones are going to get installed from your uh, explicit stream. Yep. We can add that tar there to it. And we can see uh, all the packages that were specific or explicitly installed with spec install that depend on tar. And then you can get like really, really specific, like uh, one version of card that's 1.314. We don't have anything installed with tar uh, 135, so that doesn't return anything. 134 compiled with GCC, compiled with GCC at version 13.1.1. Like the the spec language is uh, quite rich. That's so, really cool. like, if I needed to, you know, only install uh, uninstall a package that was installed with a specific version of Open MPI with a specific set of variants, I could define. Like, let's say you had like a vulnerability or something. All of a sudden, there's a vulnerability, but only in a certain version. Yep. You yep. can. Like, let's say it was Open SSL. Yeah, and then you can go reinstall everything that had depended on that version. Or T. So yeah, exactly. Like you could query, find out what the actual like potential impact is and remove them and rebuild them if you needed to. I can see where this could be really useful if you wanted to like maintain your own distribution. Like you're mm -hmm. gonna have custom distribution. Like you could use this as kind of like, you know, if you were maintaining your own like distribution package manager, you could use this as like the back end for it to build everything. Yeah. Um, you might also be interested in the Nix, uh, Nix Ops project and also the Nix package manager. If this is interesting to you, it does a lot of similar stuff, but Nix and Nix Ops are more targeted towards like generic uh, operating systems package management, whereas spec is, you know, HPC. Computer sort of yeah. interesting, yeah. Have you seen much demand for like uh, the IPP compiler or something like that? Uh, in our environment, uh, some uh, they're calling it what one API now is the branding that Intel has, and fortunately, that is a lot nicer to install than the older like Intel compiler package mess. Um,
Intel One API compilers pool. Oh. Yeah, I mean, they're in there. I think I've got one thing that actually uses this. Most of our stuff is compiled against GCC. I was experimenting with having everything compile against Clang not too long ago, just because there's been some gang, excuse me, gains with uh, Clang versus GCC or some workloads. And I was wondering if it would actually make a difference, but uh, some things just won't compile with Clang. Some things are doing a bunch of goofy uh, GCC specific nonsense. Let's see if I can find them. How does this work? Did, uh, maybe this my Intel knowledge is 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 old, but isn't like you know, like IPP, like you had to have like a license or whatever for to like use it or you know whatever. Mm -hmm. um, how does this work with that licensing requirement, or does one API not require a license anymore? I believe the way that the license works with IPP and even like the one API stuff is that it's only when the compiler itself is invoked is that license consumed and used. Uh, the binary uh, afterwards right. has no dependencies on it. So, okay. Um, but yeah, but, you'd have to set that up with SPAC so it could use it correctly, correct? Yeah. Well, probably I mean, your compilers, probably it, in your compilers config, right? That you did at the very beginning. It used. Let's look at this. Uh, okay, let's see if there's anything. Some of them will tell you in the help. Uh, some you have to look at the actual recipe, uh, but we'll have like a variable that they search for the license information. I know that, like with this one, there's a specific uh, environment variable that this binary looks for to handle its license information. Interesting. This is a rewrite. For for Intel, uh, they usually uh, will like know where on your uh, network there's a license server and check out a license yeah that's so annoying it is it really is so that i touched to make how many work the gcc time The, the real fun is convincing a researcher that no, they don't actually qualify for the uh, non commercial uh, license to commercial things with. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a, a conversation that we've been having, or having with people regarding um, Anaconda recently because their licensing terms specify like academic use and that does not necessarily cover. Uh, research or non-commercial research. What is bad? The FASP is a Vienna AB Initio Simulation Package. I don't know what the heck that means. What does that mean? Electronic Statics. Quantum Mechanics? Goodness gracious. <laughs> this is some serious stuff right here. From first principles. Uh, you know, when they say that, they mean they're serious. Yeah, this one has a lot going on with it, too. Well, well, you know, if you actually need a HPC, you're probably doing something either so embarrassingly parallelizable or something really, really super cool or both. Yeah, I, I guess what is like the coolest, 
or weirdest package you've compiled? Mm. None of them have been particularly like what I would say weird. There's just a lot of like academics should not be allowed to write software. Are the stats people using APL? Sorry, what was that? Are you the stats professors using APL? Oh, most of the stats people are using all. Most of the stats professors are using what? R. Oh, R. Okay, sorry. Going through like all of my pull requests, trying to find one that actually fixed some GCC shenanigans. Doc. Okay, well, let's look at Doc. What is Doc? Doc is a molecular docking program used in drug discovery. That sounds kind of cool. Yeah. If we're at version 6.9 of the program and we're being compiled to GCC 10 or above. You can just almost sense the frustration in what went into making that if statement. Yeah. There, there were a good two or three dozen packages uh, that just would you know have build errors during the uh, great rebuild of last year that I had to go through and get there. You know, just quite a few because I wanted to target GCC 10, which is good because you know more and more people are using GCC 10 and above now that we got a lot of these stupid things fixed. Uh, but yeah, uh, SPAC is an open source project. If you um, have you know, a problem with it and you want to get a fix, just submit a PR and usually they'll get approved as long as they're correct. Um, this is why I added that if and made some other changes to it. We historically have employed a lot of students to make uh, package recipes for us and contributed them to the project. And then anytime a student has left and I've had to touch a package afterwards, I usually take it over. Um, yeah, this one was made by one of our students at some point in the past. Uh, and some of them are uh, good uh, mindless intern work. <laughs> it's good because it, I mean, it's useful for a lot of things. Um, it teaches them how to actually use Git and uh, most comp sci students or software engineering students or computer engineering students or stat students have no idea how to use source control in any way, shape or form. Um, and this uh, is a good introduction to that. By the time they're done with this, even like within the first week, they'll be teaching like their classmates how to do stuff because, you know, they'll like, oh yeah, I totally know Git and their knowledge of Git is limited to can run Git clone. I've met a fair number of professional people that their knowledge is Git clone and Git commit and push. Or it's push. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just to be dangerous is I think what they call that. North of 50 anymore at this. Um, some of our students are still ahead of me in this. Like this guy uh, was a, uh, a student employee of ours. He is now a grad student. Um, this person was a student. Uh, they were a stat student that we employed to do a whole bunch of R packages uh, at one point in time. Check in early and check in often. Yeah, that's another one. 
Uh, but, you know, they've gone on. This guy works for you, Iowa. I think. Uh, it is a global project. Uh, it's primarily done by people out of Lawrence Livermore. Uh, Adam Stewart and Todd Gamblin are uh, both out of LNL. Uh, he's the creator. He's like the primary maintainer of Lawrence. This guy's like in Italy, I think. Um, Switzerland. You're the U Iowa guy. But people from all over, primarily the United States, I think. A lot of them are affiliated with Lawrence Livermore, it's a handful of the other national laboratories, but it really is a global uh, project. Lots of contributors, really easy to contribute to outside of the core, which is some really complex solver stuff that I don't know. Yeah, um, I don't really have anything else gone through a lot of like how we use it day to day and like some of the you know, more useful features that it has. Well, thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. That was very interesting. At this point here, I will hit the recording. Yes, I.